Okay, well, work's not over. Unfortunately, we've got to keep going. Uh, good morning, everybody. Good to see you all. Glad to see everyone's smiling faces here on day three of Board of View. I know you were, you were really worried that you would have to wait this long for endocrine emergencies because it is just everyone's favorite topic in the entire world, right? Uh, I always say, you know, let's face it, we went into emergency medicine to avoid this stuff, right? But here we are, getting ready for the boards. We've got to relearn some of this. Some of the good news is that some of the stuff in endocrine emergencies is stuff we see all the time. Stuff like DKA, hypoglycemia, you know, hyperkalemia. All right, so we're going to cut through a bunch of hormones in the talk, and then we're going to do a little bit of acid-base stuff and a little bit of electrolyte stuff, and we'll actually be done with endocrine emergencies. All right, so we'll do part one now, part two after the break, and let's just forge on. By the way, if there are any endocrinologists in the room, feel free to go out and gamble, okay? Because this is definitely endocrinology for emergency physicians. So let's start with simple things. Hypoglycemia, remember that glucose is the only energy source of the brain. It's the only thing that the brain can use. And the symptoms of hypoglycemia depend on how low your sugar is and how rapidly it dropped, okay? And you know it can mimic all sorts of things. It can make you altered. It can mimic stroke, seizures. It can cause psychosis, all sorts of things like that. Remember that insulin will, of course, drop your blood sugar, but there are the counter-regulatory hormones which will bring your blood sugar up. These are things like glucagon and epinephrine, okay? Glucagon and epinephrine will bring your blood sugar up. Remember that the way glucagon works is it breaks down and causes the relief of, release of glycogen stores from the liver, okay? So I can imagine a board question where they say, well, who might not respond well to glucagon? And it's going to be somebody with poor glycogen stores in their liver. So somebody like with cirrhosis or some other, you know, chronic liver disease, things like that, may not respond as well to glucagon as somebody who's got normal gl glycogen stores. Okay, and you know when you get hypoglycemic, you get nervous and you get tremulous, you get all that sympathetic sort of uh, stuff going on. And then you get the neurologic symptoms where you're altered and can have seizures and things like that. Remember that beta blockers can block all those sympathetic symptoms, but not the neurologic ones. And of course, in the yellow box, everyone is altered, we gotta check their sugar. That's pretty basic emergency medicine, right? Differential of hypoglycemia, lots of things could do it. You could have an insulinoma, which is actually a tumor inside the body making insulin. Uh, lots of different medications, drugs and alcohol can do it. You can have a tumor outside of the pancreas that can, that can also make insulin, so extra, uh, pancreas, excuse me, extra pancreatic cancers can do it as well. Liver disease because of depleted glycogen stores. So again, liver disease. So the cirrhotic patients who are altered, it's not always hepatic encephalopathy. It's not always alcohol intoxication. They absolutely could be in liver failure with hypoglycemia. Make sure you're checking it. If you just have a deficiency of your counter-regulatory hormones, so for example, you're a critically ill, septic, stressed out infant who's used up all of their epinephrine, all of their counter-regulatory hormone, you can get hypoglycemic from sepsis, of course. Then there's this weird thing called dumping syndrome. You know, normally you're not gonna get hypoglycemic after you eat, right? You just ate, how are you gonna get hypoglycemic? But in dumping syndrome, your GI motility is kind of altered where it kind of goes through really fast. And because of that, you get a little duodenal stretch and you over-secrete insulin. It's kind of like an overreaction to a meal. So you eat a meal and you over-secrete insulin and soon after the meal, you get hypoglycemic, okay? That's pretty unusual, that's dumping syndrome. You can get an artifactual hypoglycemia if the blood's just sitting around in the tube for too long. I'm sure you've seen this where the lab calls with some ungodly number, makes no sense at all. The blood, the person's totally awake and doing fine. The blood may have just been sitting there for too long. There's continued glycolysis from the white cells and things like that. Also, uh, leukemia, polycythemia. Whenever you got too many cells, think of it as chewing up your glucose. So that's hypoglycemia. Here's a good question for the boards and just for practice too. How do you tell whether somebody who keeps getting hypoglycemic actually has an insulinoma, that is a tumor in their body making insulin, versus they're just shooting themselves up with a bottle of insulin, right? They got like Munchausen, and they're making themselves sick with a bottle of insulin, just shooting themselves up. How do you tell where that insulin's coming from the tumor in the body or outside of the body in the bottle? And the answer to that is the C-peptide. It turns out that when, um, when uh, insulin is made uh, within the body, it's made as a big propeptide, and that propeptide is cleaved into insulin and the C-peptide. Okay, so if you have an insulinoma, which is in the body, it's making insulin, it's also making a bunch of C-peptide. 
But if you have insulin from the bottle, they don't pack any C-peptide in there, okay? It's just the insulin itself. So your C-peptide level is going to be elevated in an insulinoma, and that's how you can tell that it's actually insulinoma, not just shooting themselves up with insulin from a bottle. Okay. Treating hypoglycemia, again, you do this all the time. This is pretty straightforward. Adults get D50, right? You get an AMP of D50. Uh, kids get D25, a little more dilute. Neonates get D10, even more dilute, trying to help, you know, not irritate their veins. And I just kind of remember the rule of 50, kind of helps me remember the dosing. So an adult gets one amp of D50, right? One times 50 is 50. Kids get two cc's per kilo of D25. Two times 25 is 50. That's easy. And neonates get five cc's per kilo of D10. Five times 10 is 50. Pretty easy. So D50, D25, or D D10, depending how young they are. Glucagon, of course, we can give IM or IV, but you gotta have glycogen stores for it to work. Recurrent hypoglycemia, we stick them on a D10 drip. I'm sure you've done that many times before. If you think they are hypoglycemic because of adrenal insufficiency, because they do not have the glucocorticoids from adrenal insufficiency, you gotta treat the adrenal insufficiency too, right? So they're gonna get some steroids, some hydrocortisone, something like that. And then what about octreotide? Octreotide is an antidote for sulfonylureas. And you remember sulfonylureas, those are all those oral hypoglycemics that end in ide. And um, they, they obviously, in overdose, they cause hypoglycemia. And the way a sulfonylurea works is it kind of tickles the pancreas and has it secrete insulin, okay? So it's like stimulates the pancreas so that it secretes out insulin. Octreotide does the exact opposite. It blocks the release of insulin from the pancreas. So it's a perfect antidote for sulfonylurea. So a sulfonylurea will squeeze out the insulin, whereas this octreotide will block the release of insulin from the pancreas. So somebody's overdosed on a sulfonylurea, they're getting recurrent hypoglycemia, octreotide would be the answer for that one. Okay, so that's pretty straightforward. The next thing I want to cover was one of these really painful LLSA articles. To be honest with you, I think it was the most painful article I read of all the LLSAs. It was the one that reviewed, it was many years ago, but it reviewed all of the different oral agents you can treat diabetes. And you know, if you're not an internist, this is like kind of painful stuff to be thinking about, right? Uh, painful for me to think about. So what I'm gonna try to do is just really summarize the points that I think are important and testable and not get into minutia from this article, all right? So big picture of these oral agents for treating diabetes. Think of it as two main classes. You have your hypoglycemics, which drop your blood sugar, and your anti-hyperglycemics, which really just keep your blood sugar from going up. And the reason that's an important difference is when you overdose on a hypoglycemic, you get hypoglycemic. But if you overdose on one of these anti-hyperglycemics that just keeps your sugar from going up, you are probably not going to get hypoglycemic, okay? And that certainly shows up in the ED and could show up on the board exam. So let's kind of go over these. The hypoglycemics, the ones that will drop your blood sugar. The big bad one of them, of course, are the sulfonylureas, which we just talked about a little bit, all the ones that end in ide, right? Glipizide, gliburide, all these ide, you know, sort of uh, medicines. Uh, stimulate the pancreas to make insulin. Uh, they have very long half-lives, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> and because of that, they can cause profound hypoglycemia and persistent hypoglycemia and overdose. And that's why when people overdose on these sulfonylureas, they're almost always going to be admitted, right? If they get, if, certainly if they get hypoglycemic at all, you may as well just bring them in because it's going to be lasting a long, long time. So those patients who, who, who overdose on it and do get hypoglycemic from it are going to be coming into the hospital. So those are the sulfonylureas. <coughs> Excuse me. The other one is Prandin, which is repaglinide or repaglinide. I don't know how you say it. But basically, all you got to know is it's also one of those that an overdose will cause hypoglycemia, like the sulfonylureas. Okay? So those are the hypoglycemic ones. Now, the ones that keep your blood sugar from going up are less likely to cause hypoglycemia in overdose. These are things like metformin, which of course you know about and you see patients on all the time. The other trivia point about metformin is that it can cause lactic acidosis, especially in patients with renal insufficiency, right? Renal impairment. It's not like real common, but it does happen. So metformin can cause a lactic acidosis. That's the trivia point to know about that one. And an overdose, it's not gonna make you hypoglycemic. You got these things called Alpha glucose, excuse me, alpha glucosidase inhibitors. These are basically sugar blockers. They work in the gut. They block the breakdown of these polysaccharides so that it doesn't get absorbed. 
So again, if you overdose on that, you're not going to get hypoglycemic. You're just not absorbing as much sugar, okay? That's what you need to know about that one. And then there are this weird class of agents called the thiazolidine dione's. Gotta love that name. This is Avandia and Actose that you've heard about, okay? <clears throat> uh, and the main thing to know about those, again, they're not going to cause hypoglycemia, probably an overdose. Uh, trivia about those, um, they cause fluid retention. So they can cause worsening of CHF. So you got a patient in CHF or has a history of CHF, they get put on Avandia, they get put on Actose, one of those agents, now they come in the ED and pulmonary edema, that's the medicine you need to know about that's associated with it. And then Avandia also has a black box warning for acute MI. So just remember cardiac complications of those, you know, those Avandia and Actose medications, and you're probably going to get those right on the exam too. Okay? And then the, mo the more recent agent that was actually not in the article because it's more recent are these SGLT2 inhibitors. Um, basically, these are like cause an osmotic diuresis. They basically increase the renal secretion of glucose. So you just start pee out a whole bunch of glucose in your, in your urine. And because of that, you know, again, you're not going to get hypoglycemic, but you might get hypovolemic. You may have orthostatic hypotension and things like that. You may have syncope, but basically it's just an osmotic diuresis. So it's like giving a mannitol or something like that in some ways, right? Think of it that way. You secrete glucose out. It's an osmotic diuresis. All right, so those are the oral agents, the hypoglycemics, which will drop your sugar, the antihyperglycemics, which just keep it from going up. And I think that's all you got to know about the factoids and the mechanisms of those agents. And if you know that, you should get all those exam questions right. So some final pearls for hypoglycemia. Again, we already mentioned, always admit the sulfonylurea overdoses. Most will be sym uh, symptomatic within four hours, but it can be delayed. Octreotide is the antidote for the sulfonylureas. Malnourished patients who um, are hypoglycemic or you're giving them glucose, you also want to give them thymine. What are we trying to prevent here? Wernicke's encephalopathy, right? Wernicke's encephalopathy. So if they're thymine depleted and you give them their sugar, you want to make sure you're also giving them some thymine as well so they do not develop Wernicke's encephalopathy. Now, we were all taught in medical school, or at least my generation of medical school. I don't know about the newer generation. We were all taught you got to give the thymine before the glucose. Right? That's what we were supposed to do. The reality is, those were like studies of people who were on days of inf glucose infusion drips and they, they got Wernicke's without getting thiamine. So I don't think you have to get the thiamine right before the glucose, but you should give the thiamine soon, right? So give the glucose. If their sugar's 20, give them the glucose. But if they're really malnourished, chronic alcoholics, folks like that, make sure they're getting some thiamine in the ED as well so they don't develop Wernicke encephalopathy. And we already talked about where glucagon may not work in anybody who, who uh, uh, has bad glycogen stores, so basically liver disease. Okay, so that's low sugar. Pretty simple. Let's move on to DKA, which is something that you see all the time. Quick review of the pathophysiology. Um, if you remember, uh, basically the problem here is a lack of insulin. If you don't have insulin, your blood sugar goes up. Your blood sugar goes up, you start peeing it out, osmotic diuresis, so you get dehydrated, you lose fluids, you lose electrolytes, you know, potassium phosphate, all that good stuff. You also have this lack of insulin with your blood sugar going up, but your body can't use that sugar because it can't get into the cells. So you start to break down the fats into the fatty acids, and that's why you have the ketoacidosis, all right? So it's all a lack of insulin problem. Osmotic diuresis, lose electrolytes, and the ketoacidosis. And remember that acidosis is why you'll see patients with Kussmaul respirations, those big, real big, fast and real deep respirations. You see that thin patient coming in, you're like, I think that patient's in DKA, all right? They're trying to compensate for that metabolic acidosis. Precipitants of DKA, uh, before I get into the eyes, I want to give you a general thing about all of the endocrine emergencies we're going to talk about today. Almost every endocrine emergency can be precipitated by almost any acute stressor. You really don't have to memorize a list of all the bad things that can precipitate adrenal insufficiency or a thyroid storm or DKA, all these sort of things, because the reality is any acute stressor will precipitate any of them. The, the glands just do not like acute stressors, so you don't have to really memorize a, a hopeful list. These are a bunch of eyes that can precipitate uh, DKA, but again, any acute stressor can do it. I usually remember the first four eyes because it just gives me a place to start when I'm looking at somebody in DKA just to think about. And that's, you know, do they have an infection? Do they have an infarction, acute MI? Do they have insulin, lack of insulin, so insulin noncompliance? Or IUP, intrauterine pregnancy, or are they pregnant? All right? So I'm thinking, hmm, are they infected? They've been taking their insulin, are they having an MI, are they pregnant? That's a good place to start. 
But the reality is any acute stressor can precipitate these things. Glands do not like stress. Fluid and bicarbon decay. You know these patients are all dry. They're going to get lots of fluid. You want to give them initial fluid resuscitation to get rid of their hypovolemia. You want to replace their electrolytes. You want to start them on an insulin drip, right, to start reversing that ketoacidosis. But remember, you do not start them on an insulin drip until you know what their serum potassium is. Because insulin is going to do what to your potassium? Drop it, right? And when you fix someone's acidosis with all the fluids you're giving them, what's that going to do to your potassium? Drop it. So everything you do to treat DKA is going to drop their potassium. So you need to know where you're starting. And if you're starting high or normal, that's one thing. But if you're starting low and you start giving them insulin, you can give them severe hypokalemia and they can arrest in front of you. Not a good shift, okay? So always know the potassium level before you start the insulin drip. Really important. And let's talk for a moment about sodium bicarb. Those of you that have been practicing for a while understand that this has always been controversial in DKA, right? Should we use bicarb? Should we not use bicarb? How much should we use? The reality is the boards are not going to test you on controversial things. Um, we don't use it very much now, as you know, uh, if maybe at all. Um, but there are some testable factoids about bicarb that I think are fair game for the exam. Okay, so let me give you what I think are testable factoids that are fair game. The first is when you give someone bicarb, you're making their blood, right, look better. You're getting rid of their acidosis from their blood. But you give them the bicarb, it kind of gets up across the blood-brain barrier, you know, turns into CO2, goes across the blood-brain barrier, and then gets trapped in the brain. And because of that, you get a CSF acidosis. So even though you're making their blood look better, you're fixing the acidosis in their blood, you can have a paradoxical worsening acidosis in the brain. You don't want acidosis in your brain. It makes you altered, leaky brain, cerebral edema, those sort of things, right? So that's one of the hazards of bicarb is this paradoxical CSF acidosis. The other thing bicarb does, if you remember, I know it's kind of painful, but that oxygen hemoglobin dissociation curve, remember that thing? It shifts it to the left. What that means is that hemoglobin is stingy. It doesn't want to drop off oxygen at the tissues as much as it used to, all right? And if you're acidemic, you kind of want, want some oxygen at your tissues, right? You don't want to be hypoxic at your tissues. So this makes it worse as well. So it messes up with the brain. It's getting less tissue delivery of oxygen. That's another bad thing. And of course, bicarb is sodium bicarb, so you can get sodium overload, volume overload. Bicarb will drop your potassium, so that can also make you hypokalemic, okay? Uh, and it turns out in kids, it has been independently predicted of kids in DKA who will develop cerebral edema. This was a study many years ago in New England Journal. They took a bunch of kids in DKA, and they said, which kids go on to develop cerebral edema? Which will predict this bad outcome in kids you know, who have DKA? And they looked at all sorts of predictors and did their fancy statistics in New England Journal, right? And they found that there were three things that predicted which kids were going to develop the cerebral edema. Two of them were just lab markers. We can't fix a lab marker. It's just a lab value. But only one thing was something we actually did as doctors, and that's given bicarb. So giving bicarb to kids in DKA is independently associated with them developing cerebral edema. So I would really avoid it in kids, all right? So those are the testable factoids of bicarb, all right, for DKA. Okay, sodium, phosphate. Um, if you remember, as your blood sugar goes up, your serum sodium goes down, okay? And what ha the reason that happens, as your sugar's going up, your body pulls fluid in to dilute it out, right? And as it dilutes out the sugar, it's also dilu diluting out your serum sodium. They call that pseudo-hyponatremia, but it is real. It's not pseudo like it's fake. It's just pseudo because it's not that you've lost the sodium particles. You've just diluted it out. But it is a real hyponatremia. For whatever cause, as your blood sugar goes up, your serum sodium is going to drop because you're starting to pull in more fluid into your body, okay? In, excuse me, into your, into your bloodstream, okay? Um, and there is a formula. There's actually a couple different formulas. But there's a formula that you can use to try to predict depending on how high your glucose is, how low is your sodium going to go, okay? And I'll start with like one formula and I'll tell you a little twist on it, okay? One formula is that for every 100 that your blood sugar goes up over 100, your serum sodium is gonna drop by about 1.6, okay? So that would mean, for example, if you had a serum glucose of 600, 600 is 500 above 100, five times 1.6 is eight. 
So that would mean in, instead of your serum sodium being 140, normal, it'll drop down to 132. So what I mean by that is if you got someone's chemistries and it says glucose 600, sodium um, 132, you could say if you're using that formula that that makes perfect sense. That's a perfect balance. The sugar went up, the sodium went down, okay? Um, some people like a bigger number. They like to use 2.4. This comes from a study of like, it was like four or six like healthy volunteers that they made hypoglycemic. And they said, actually, we think 2.4 is a better number than 1.6. If that were the case, the example I, I gave you, instead of dropping by eight, it would drop by 12, okay? So it's about 50% more, all right? And I don't think it's so important that you know the exact number, but I think it's uh, important that you understand the concept and you have some idea of the range of what's going to happen with this. And why would this ever be important, other than the board exam, why would it ever be important in your life? Well, you can imagine a patient in front of you where their sugar is elevated. It's 600, it's 700, something like that, and their serum sodium is normal. It's 140. It would be really easy to blow by that and just say, oh, sodium's normal, that's not a problem. But if you correct that, if you add that 8 or 12 back on to that number, right, it's not 140, it's 148 or 152, it's something like that. That patient is really, really dehydrated, okay? So if you see somebody who's sugar 6 or 700 and their sodium is normal, they're actually really, really dry because their sodium should be low. All right, that's the, the reason I want you to understand that point. Okay, phosphate, you know, you, in DKA you pee out everything. You pee out your sugar, you pee out potassium, you pee out phosphate. So they get hypophos as well. You need phosphate to make ATP, ATP for energy. So when they get hypophos, they get weak. So you want to replete their phosphate. Okay. Potassium, really important. Total body potassium is probably down because you're peeing out your potassium. But your serum potassium could be low, normal, or high depending on their acid base status and depending on their renal function, if their kidneys are still working. So you really do not know what their serum sodium is even though their, their total body is probably down. That's why you have to check it before you start that insulin drip. And the way it kind of works is, you know, if their serum sodium is, you know, let's just say um, low, you got to start repleting their potassium. I'm not sodium, I'm sorry. If their serum potassium is low, you start to replete their potassium. And then once you get it up to normal, you can start your insulin drip. If their first serum potassium is normal, you start your insulin drip and you give them a little bit of potassium along with it too, right? Because you don't want them to drop too much. And if their initial potassium is high, you start your insulin drip, you wait till their potassium comes down into normal and they're peeing so that you know their kidneys work, then you start adding your potassium in as well so they don't get too low, all right? So just watch the potassium in DKA. That's really, really important. Complications of treating DKA. They can get hypoglycemic from all the insulin we're giving them. You can get hypokalemia. We already talked about that. The insulin, the fixing the acidosis, if you give them bicarb. Bicarb um, can cause that CSF acidosis. And we talked about cerebral edema as well. These are patients that are getting altered mental status, bad complication of DKA. So that's DKA. We went over it. And hopefully now you know all the other testable points that could show up because I know you know how to take care of these patients. Now let's do AKA, alcoholic ketoacidosis. You are at a board review course in Las Vegas. It is day three. You had to sit through endocrine emergencies, okay? And you said, I'm out. You said, I'm going to go drinking. Forget the review session. I'm going drinking. So you go out and you start drinking alcohol and drinking and drinking and drinking. And of course, you're not eating so much food because, hey, you got your liquid diet that you're on there, right? And you drink for a couple of days and then you stop. And of course, the next morning you feel bad. But, but you know, a day to two after that, you start to feel really bad not just hungover, but like really, really bad. Nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain. You just feel horrible, okay? You have a really bad acidosis is what's going on now. You kind of feel like somebody who's in DKA. You feel like really, really miserable. You present to the ED, nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain. So what is going on there is what's called alcoholic ketoacidosis. Binge drinking, heavy alcohol, not taking a lot of food. So you get this kind of relative hypoglycemia. Um, the alcohol itself, ethanol, will inhibit gluconeogenesis. It's another reason you get this relative hypoglycemia. And because you have this hypoglycemia, you develop a ketoacidosis, just like in DKA, all right? So you're dry, you got belly pain, you got a ketoacidosis that's going on, you feel really, really sick. Alcohol levels in AKA should be normal, zero, right? This is not when you're drunk, this is when you're undrunk. This is when you've stopped drinking, you're now in alcoholic ketoacidosis, all right? Um, you know, you got, again, you got a metabolic acidosis, so you're going to have an elevated anion gap with alcohol ketoacidosis. It's a metabolic acidosis. That makes sense. 
What about the ketones, though? If you measure their serum, of course you're going to have positive ketones, because I just told you it's alcoholic ketoacidosis. You have lots of ketones. But in your urine, the dip, urine dip may be only weakly positive. So you're thinking, shouldn't it be really positive? It may be only weakly positive. If you remember, there's two main types of ketones, acetoacetate and beta-hydroxybutyrate. It turns out that in alcoholic ketoacidosis, the main ketone is beta-hydroxybutyrate. So they're making lots of beta-hydroxybutyrate and a little bit, relatively, of acetoacetate. And it turns out the urine dipstick only picks up acetoacetate, not beta-hydroxybutyrate. And the way I remember it is very simplistically. I just think to myself, like when they invented the urine dipstick test, they invented it and they got the A and they didn't get the B, all right? So the dipstick will pick up the acetoacetate, but it won't pick up beta-hydroxybutyrate. And that's what you get in alcoholic ketoacidosis. So even though they've got plenty of ketones in their blood, their urine is only weakly positive for ketones. Really testable point that could show up on the exam. Okay, so the patient has come in your emergency department, belly pain, nausea, vomiting, alcoholic ketoacidosis, and you're thinking, yeah, I know how to deal with this. I give them some fluids, I give them some Zofran, I do that all the time, right? Um, the special thing here is you want to give them D5 normal saline. So they need some substrate there, right? Because they have this ketoacidosis with this relative hypoglycemia. So it's not just normal saline and Zofran, it's D5 normal saline and some Zofran, all right? So that's what they need, and then they're going to get better. That's alcoholic ketoacidosis. Okay, so it's another ketoacidosis like DK, but not the same. The next thing we need to cover, hyperosmolar, hyperglycemic, non-ketotic state. So this is another state where you have really high blood sugars, so kind of like DKA, but there are some differences and very testable differences. I could write a number of questions for the boards just about differences between DKA and this state, this HH and, and you know, uh, N, N, S, uh, this hyper osmolar, hyperglycemic, non-ketotic state, okay? So it's similar to DKA. They both have elevated blood sugars, but there are some differences. So for example, there is no ketoacidosis in this. DKA has ketoacidosis. This is non-ketotic, okay? Or, or at least low ketones, all right? So it's, it's, not, a, it's not a big ketoacid, ketoacidosis state like DKA is. The glucose here is oftentimes really high, 800, 900, 1,000, 1,200. You've seen these patients, right? Elderly patient from nursing home, pneumonia, comes in really dry, sugar's 1,400. That's this state. That's not DKA. That's this state, okay? Really high blood sugar, whereas DKA is usually not more than 600 or so, right? It's not like 1,200. Osms are very, very high. Um, this usually occurs in non-insulin-dependent diabetics, whereas DKA, of course, it's type 1 insulin-dependent diabetics. In fact, for this state, about half of the patients did not know they even had diabetes until they showed up with this, okay? So this is their first presentation for about half of these patients. So non-insulin dependent diabetics with this. And the mortality is higher than in DKA. Uh, these patients tend to be older, they have mo more co comorbid conditions, um, uh, you know, lots of, lots of, and it's been going on for a longer period of time. So this has a higher mortality than DKA on average. Not, 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 not everybody, of course, but on average, higher mortality than DKA. And DKA is a shorter onset, right? You stopped your insulin yesterday, and now you're in the emergency department in DKA, whereas this thing has been going on over a couple of weeks. They got sick, they got a little pneumonia, a little cough, they didn't drink so much, they got dehydrated, worse and worse, and over the couple of weeks, they got really bad, okay? So those are the differences. Very testable, know the differences. Precipitating factors, anything bad. Any acute stressor, don't even bother memorizing the list. Any acute stressor will do it. Okay. Comorbid conditions, they tend to have renal and cardiac disease, and they tend to be on renal and cardiac meds. That's the way I remember it. You're not going to remember everything. Just remember renal and cardiac disease, renal and cardiac meds. So these are elderly patients with renal disease and vascular disease, and, you know, they don't have great access to water, so they get dry. Where they're on renal or cardiac meds like diuretics, beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, those are the things to remember, Okay. When they come into the ED, they are profoundly dehydrated and they're altered. So they are altered and they look really, really dry with their blood sugars of 1,200 and things like that. They can, they can have focal neurologic signs, but that's pretty rare. They're usually just altered and very, very dry. The treatment for this is to rehydrate them is the most important thing. So they're very, very dry. You give them some normal saline. Remember, they're really dry. Big deficits of like 8 to 12 liters. And remember, we want to fix things slowly in general with endocrine emergencies in general not hypoglycemia, but most things, fix it slowly. So half their deficit in the first 12 hours and the other half over the next, you know, 24 hours, something like that. Fix it slowly, 
get them volume repleted, but slowly. Um, and then, of course, and, in, and then insulin as well. You can start them on insulin at the bottom there, insulin infusion as well. Low dose insulin infusion. They don't need a bolus. You don't need to bring their sugar down real fast, but some fluids, a little insulin infusion, and then try to figure out what the underlying condition was. Oftentimes, they have some acute precipitate as well. All right? If you treat this too fast, they can develop cerebral edema. A number of these patients are probably hypernatremic because they're dry. Fixing that too fast, correcting it too fast can cause cerebral edema. So don't do it too quickly. All right. So we did a bunch of sugar, low sugar, high sugar, all sorts of stuff like that. Now let's move on to our friend, the thyroid. Let's do a couple of glands here. The thyroid. Okay, if you remember the way this works, you got your hypothalamus, which secretes some thyroid uh, releasing hormone which goes to your pituitary, your anterior pituitary, and your anterior pituitary secretes out TSH. That's thyroid stimulating hormone, right? So the anterior pituitary makes TSH. That goes to your thyroid, and it binds to the TSH receptors, and it stimulates the thyroid, like it says. It stimulates the thyroid to make thyroid hormone. The thyroid makes a bunch of T4. Remember that T4 then peripherally gets deiodinated into T3, and that both T4 and T3 are active, but T3 is like the big guns, right? It's like the more biologically active of the two things. You got your T4 and your T3, which is really active. And then, of course, the thyroid hormone, the T4 and T3, feed back at the pituitary to, you know, say, hey, don't make so much more TSH. We got plenty of thyroid hormone, right? So that's the usual loop. You kind of remember that. And remember that the thyroid hormone just increases your metabolic state. It revs everything up. That's what it does. Okay, let's start with hyperthyroidism. Rule of thumb I want you to remember, when there's a problem with the thyroid, whether it's high thyroid or low thyroid, it is usually the thyroid itself. It is not usually the hypothalamic pituitary axis that's messed up. When it's the thyroid, it's usually the thyroid itself, primary hyper or hypothyroidism, okay? Something is wrong with the thyroid. The most common cause of hyperthyroid, which is at the thyroid, is Graves' disease. Do you remember what Graves' disease? It's an autoimmune disorder where your body is making antibodies and the antibodies look just like TSH. They look like TSH. So they go to the thyroid and they stimulate the thyroid and they make you hyperthyroid. That's exactly what Graves' disease does, okay? It makes you very hyperthyroid, that's what it does. You can have other causes within the thyroid itself. Uh, toxic adenoma, multinodular goiters, thyroiditis, you know, you know, meaning which can be viral, or it can be autoimmune. There's this thing called Hashimoto thyroiditis, which is when you get um, lymphocytes that infiltrate your thyroid. They kind of get in there and infiltrate. And when they first infiltrate, it'll make you hyperthyroid. Now, eventually, it burns out the thyroid, and then they get hypothyroid, okay? But thyroiditis, either viral or autoimmune, can cause it as well. Usually, the thyroid itself. Yes, you can have a pituitary adenoma secreting out TSH, but it's just less common than the thyroid itself. And too much iodine can do it, too. Okay, so it's usually the thyroid itself. Graves is the most common. Signs and symptoms of hyperthyroidism. Remember, everything's revved up. So, you know, you're nervous, you're tremulous, you can't sleep because you're revved up. You don't tolerate heat because you're already making plenty of heat on your own, right? Uh, you get weak, you, uh, you know, you get weight loss. You get tachycardic and palpitations, maybe AFib, things like that. Um, hyperdefecation, everything's moving quickly, bowels moving real quickly, all those sort of things. Maybe a big goiter with a brewy over it. That's always a nice hint on exam if you see that. Um, look at the picture here. This is some exophthalmos here, right? The, the kind of what looks like kind of proptosis sort of thing. The eyeball's very prominent there. This is seen only in Graves' disease. So not the other causes of hyperthyroidism. This is only in Graves' disease. And the reason you see this in Graves' disease is it turns out that back behind the eye there, there are these fibroblasts and fat cells, those adipocytes, and they have TSH receptors on them. So that antibody that's going to your, you know, to your thyroid, looking like TSH and making you hyperthyroidism, that same antibody is going to those fat cells and fibroblasts behind your eyes and causing them to like proliferate and secrete stuff and things like that. So stuff starts to accumulate behind the eyeball and it starts to get proptotic. So that's only in Graves' disease because it's the antibody thing that's doing it, okay? You don't get it from the other causes. So they get proptosis. They get this other thing called lid lag, lid lag. So normally in a patient, if I'm having them look forward and I just say, look down at your feet, not your whole face, just your eyeballs. Look down at your feet. As their eyes look down, 
eyeballs move down, and the lid moves right with your eye. That's a normal thing to happen, right? If you just look at each other and you look down, you'll see your eyelid kind of moves with your eye. That's a normal thing to happen. But in lid lag, it's just like it says, the lid lags. So the eyeballs move down and the lid's kind of more slow. And you may see the sclera on the top of the eyeball and things like that. Okay, so that's lid lag. So um, uh, the, the, the um, exophthalmos and the lid lag are with Graves disease. Also in Graves' disease, you can get pretibial myxedema. I'm not talking general myxedema. I'm talking just pretibial, kind of this infiltrative stuff. There's this nodular plaques that develop there. Again, it's the fibroblast there. It's, it's all the same thing that's happening, making these like polysaccharides, all right? So basically, it's the same thing. They get all stimulated, and they, 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 they make this stuff. So they make it behind the eye. They make it in front of the legs. That's Graves' disease, okay? Yellow waxy nodules, pretibial myxedema. Okay. Um, any sort of thyroid disorder, family history is, is a risk factor, and being a female. So women are more common to have either hyper or hypothyroidism. Thyroid disease is more common in women. Okay, let's do about the labs in hyperthyroidism. Because it's usually the thyroid itself making too much thyroid hormone, your T3, your T4, those are going to be elevated, and your TSH is going to be low, right? Because of feedback at the, at the, at the hypothalamus. Okay, that makes, that makes pretty much sense. Okay. Um, treating hyperthyroidism, if it's mild hyperthyroidism, somebody you're sending home, uh, they may just, they, they may get a beta blocker, or they may just get something like uh, PTU or methimazole, uh, more likely methimazole, okay? Uh, turns out that um, PTU has more liver toxicity, so more likely they're going to put somebody home on methimazole, right? So they may get a little beta blocker, they may get some methimazole when they go, when they go out, more likely. And then, of course, there are things that you do to treat the disorder. So they may get radioactive iodine for their thyroid or surgery for their thyroid. For example, if they have graves, they may try to blast out the thyroid, depending on what's going on. Just depends, okay? So that's mild hyperthyroidism. Now, thyroid storm, really important stuff. Sick patients in the ED. This is when you have life-threatening manifestations of hyperthyroidism. It's the extreme end of it now, okay? Precipitating events, again, Anything bad, you do not have to memorize the whole list. The only thing I would remember is IV contrast. So it's any acute stressor, anything you can think of, stroke, bleeds, drugs, whatever, trauma, but infection, but IV contrast. So I can imagine, you know, so they have iodinated contrast. So somebody, you know, they say, walked into your emergency department, oh, recently had an IV contrast study, and now they're tremulous and tachycardic and blah, 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 right? Think about IV contrast as something that precipitates thyroid storm, but any acute stressor can do it. What makes it thyroid storm? It's not a lab test. It's not a TSH level. It's not a T3 level. It's all about a clinical diagnosis. It's basically when you're starting to get CNS disorder, so altered mental status. So somebody starts to get altered, now they're in thyroid storm, okay? So they're altered. They may have a little elevated temperature. Uh, they'll be very tachycardic, even out of proportion to that temperature, okay? And again, all the other symptoms of hyperthyroidism we talked about there. But it's a clinical diagnosis. They're really sick. Labs, again, because it's usually the thyroid itself, elevated T4, elevated T3, but a low TSH. And then I want to talk to you about these other labs, okay? The ones below those, so all this stuff down here. Okay, the sugar, the calcium, the LFTs, everything goes up. All these other labs go up. The sugar goes up. The calcium goes up because of blood turnover. The LFTs goes up. The only thing that goes down are the cholesterol. Okay, the lipids, the cholesterol goes down. And the way I think of it is your hyperthyroid, everything's revved up, your tachycardic, things are going, everything's going up, right? All of your blood tests, all these, you know, these, these glucose, calcium, LFTs, they all go up except for your cholesterol, which goes down because, you know, you're so active with your hyperthyroidism that you drop your cholesterol, all right? Not the actual mechanism, but it'll help you remember it, all right? So all these other labs go up, just like the thyroid's up, the cholesterol goes down. Treating thyroid storm. This is actually really important, okay? It's important for your practice and for the exam. Um, you need to know the steps of treating this. It does matter the order of these, at least to some degree. Uh, so the first thing you do is, in general, you give supportive care, right? So you give, them, you give them some IV fluids, you fix your electrolytes, things like that. But you give them a dose of steroids. So you're giving this person in thyroid storm a dose of corticosteroids, like 100 hydrocortisone. Why are we doing it? Somebody tell me. Why are we giving them steroids? Because 
Yeah, I heard the word adrenal. That's right. It's, they have a relative adrenal insufficiency, okay? So a normal person wouldn't need some steroids, but because their metabolic rate is, you know, doubled and tripled and quadrupled or whatever it is with a thyroid storm, their, their, their adrenals, even though they're working normally, they need help. They need stress dose steroids, right? So anybody in thyroid storm, they need some additional help, they get some corticosteroids. They give them 100 hydrocortisone. Okay, now let's start fixing things. Um, they're real tachycardic, so we start giving them some propranolol to get their heart rate under control. The truth is you could use any beta blocker. The reason we like propranolol, at least one of the reasons that we like propranolol, is it also blocks the peripheral conversion of T4 to T3. So you don't make as much of that really active stuff. So an extra bonus with that beta blocker is it blocks the peripheral conversion of T4 to T3. By the way, so do the steroids that we gave for the adrenal insufficiency. That'll also reduce the peripheral conversion of T4 to T3. Okay, so it's an extra bonus. So that's why we like propranolol. So you give them a little propranolol, you know, a milligram at a time, get their heart rate under control, things like that. Okay, now we got their heart rate under control. We want to stop them from making all this thyroid hormone. So you can either put them on PTU or methimazole, but here I want you to use the PTU, the propothiouracil. It blocks the enzyme, so you stop making thyroid hormone. Why PTU over methimazole? Well, PTU also will block that peripheral conversion of T4 to T3, okay? So you get less, so it means it's gonna work faster and better than the methimazole is. And even though methimazole has less risk of liver toxicity, if someone's in thyroid storm, you want the PTU. If someone's in mild hyperthyroidism and going home, you can put them on methimazole. But when they're in storm, you want the PTU. You want the big guns, right? And then later, when you get it under control, they can transition them to methimazole. But you start with the PTU. So you gave them some steroids to help their adrenals and block peripheral conversion. You gave them some beta blocker to control their heart rate and block peripheral conversion. And you gave them some PTU to stop making hormone and to block peripheral conversion. And then the last thing, or not the last thing, but the next thing you want to do is to give them iodine. You want to basically block the release of whatever hormone was already made in the gland, okay? So they're not making any more. We've shut it down. But there's still some in there, and we want to stop its release. And for that, you give iodine. You can use iodinated you know, oral, oral contrast. You can use SSKI, that saturated solution of potassium iodide. Basically, you're going to look it up, okay? But you know that you're going to give them some iodine is what you're going to end up giving them for that. And this is a really important point. You have to wait. You have to wait at least an hour after you've given the PTU so that the PTU will shut down the machinery before you give the iodine. Otherwise, the iodine is sucked up into the thyroid and you make more thyroid hormone, okay? So you've got to wait at least an hour. So some steroids, some beta blocker, get it under control. Some PTU, shut down the machinery. Wait an hour. Then give them some iodine to block the release. And then the final thing is, you know, figure out what was the precipitating event, right? What was, was their stroke, their bleed, their, their pneumonia? What was it? What was going on? All right? So that is thyroid storm. Really important. Some testable stuff in there. Okay. You know how in elderly patients, they present differently with everything, right? You know, like their appendicitis is different. They're not as tender. They don't get as much of a white count. They're, everything like always presents a little more subtly in elderly patients. Hyperthyroidism can also present a little differently in, in elderly patients, and it's this thing called apathetic thyrotoxicosis. They look apathetic, but they've got thyrotoxicosis, okay? So instead of looking all revved up, they look more like, you know, you know stare, droopy eyelids, you know, uh, slowed mentation, lethargy. They look more like depressed or something like that. But they're hyperthyroid, and their heart knows they're hyperthyroid because it's tachycardic, and they're an AFib, and maybe they've got, you know, high output CHF and things like that. So they are hyperthyroid. It's just in these elderly patients, kind of like many things, the external signs look a little different, okay? They look more masked face. So that's what apathetic thyrotoxicosis is. I just don't want you to miss that when you see somebody who's, you know, elderly and altered or looking depressed or whatever in the ED. It could be this, you know, apathetic thyrotoxicosis. Okay, so that was the high thyroid. Now we're going to do the low thyroid. And since we covered a lot, I think it'll be easier. With the low thyroid, again, what causes it? Usually the thyroid itself. Most commonly, treatment of Graves' disease. Someone had Graves', which was very common, and now we treated it with iodine, and we, were, we get, took, took the thyroid out or something like that, and they're hypothyroid. Uh, iodine deficiency in the diet can do it. Remember the autoimmune, the Hashimoto's thyroiditis, where the lymphocytes come in and make your make you elevated initially and then burn it out and make you hypothyroid. 
And then there's some medicines that I think you should know are associated with hypothyroidism. Lithium and amiodarone are two to remember. You know, there's obviously other things, but those are ones that I think are pretty testable. Lithium and amiodarone associated with hypothyroidism. And of course, it could be the pituitary or hypothalamic stuff. You got a, you got a stroke in your pituitary or a tumor or something, and it's not making TSH. But those are less common than the thyroid itself. Signs and symptoms of hypothyroid, everything is slow. Everything is sluggish. So you're weak, lethargic. You don't tolerate the cold because you're not making heat to begin with. Hypothermia, you're gaining weight, you're constipated, things are moving slowly. Dry skin, right? These sorts of things. And you can see the picture there, the before and after of what it looks like, you know, you know, before when they had hypothyroidism and then after some treatment, back to normal, okay? But that's the slow, sluggish, and big and puffy stuff going on too. Um, you can look at hair loss, particularly the lateral thirds of the eyebrows. That's a kind of a good, good kind of just clinical pearl. Lateral thirds of the eye, eyebrows lose some hair loss there. It's a good place to look. Uh, they get slowed mentation, psychosis, things like that. Um, cardiac, of course, they can get bradycardia. Uh, they can get um, CHF. And they, they tend to kind of accumulate fluid. So they can get pleural effusions and pericardial effusions and generalized myxedema, things like this, okay? So, so basically hypothyroidism, they accumulate fluid. Labs, because it's the thyroid itself, your T4, your T3 are gonna be low, your TSH is gonna be high, trying to get that thyroid to work, okay? And then what about the other labs, not the, not the hormone level labs, but the other labs? With hypothyroidism, you get all the hypos now. You get hypoxia, okay, hypoxemia, low oxygen, hypothermia and mix up even come up, hyponatremia, everything's low, anemia, low blood count. Okay, so everything's low except for the lipids. The lipids are going up. And again, I just think about hypothyroidism, all those other like chemistries and stuff are low, but your cholesterol has gone up because you're so slow and sluggish that your lipids gone up. All right, that's the way to remember for the test. That's hypothyroidism. Myxedema coma, kind of like thyroid storm, it's just the end of the spectrum. Thyroid storm at this end, myxedema coma at the other end, right? Life-threatening hypothyroidism, lots of different precipitating factors. Any acute bad thing can do it. Don't have to memorize the list. The things I would remember are cold exposure. So it's more common in winter and in cold exposure. So for those of you who live in areas of the country where it gets really cold, particularly during winter, somebody gets outside, you know, you get a 55-year-old woman comes in your emergency department, little bradycardic, hypothermic, altered, maybe was out in the cold a little too much. Think about myxedema coma. So she probably had hypothyroidism and got that acute stressor and now is there with myxedema coma, all right? So cold is the other thing I would remember for precipitating myxedema coma. Okay, again, signs of myxedema coma, as I already talked about, they're hypothermic, they're altered. They get these, um, what they call hung up reflexes. So it's delayed relaxation phase. So here, let's just do my arm here. Normal patient reflexes, right? That's normal, up and down. We've seen that before, normal biceps. These are the hung up ones, okay? Hung up, so slowed relaxation phase. The patient that I just described to you comes into your emergency department. I know we're not big into checking reflexes, but just check a reflex and see what happens. And if they do this thing, you can look like a superstar and say, you know what, I think that might be mixed hemocoma, all right? Start sending off the labs. Check up for those hung up reflexes. And again, they get generalized pitting edema. They look like that when they come in your emergency department. Treating mixed edema coma, again, supportive care, so warm fluids, you know, external rewarming, things like that, IV fluids, rewarming, and then they need the thyroid hormone, okay? So they need some thyroid hormone back. Uh, and you can even give T4 or T3 or both. Uh, the only thing I'll tell you is that T3, remember I said it's more active, so it can cause some ventricular arrhythmias. Mm, not so fun, right? So, you know, you can do T4, you can do T3, you can do both. Depends on what your endocrinologist wants. Me, personally, I just start with some T4 because I know they're getting something and it feels less dangerous than starting with the T3, all right? And then I call upstairs and say, hey, what do you really want? You want more of this and more of that? And I give them whatever they say, okay? But some IV thyroxine, they need the hormone back. Patients in mixed edema coma also get a dose of steroids. Okay, they also get like 100 hydrocortisone, for example. Um, why do we do that in myxedema coma? Here, we're worried again about adrenal insufficiency, but we're worried maybe it's not the thyroid itself. Maybe it was a pituitary cause of hypothyroid. 
And maybe with that pituitary being messed up, they're also adrenal insufficient. So we're going to just go ahead and empirically give them 100 hydrocortisone as well. So easy to remember for us, whether it's thyroid storm at this end or mixed edema coma at this end, either bad end of thyroid disease, you go ahead and give them a stress dose of steroids. Pretty simple. For different reasons, but it works. All right? So supportive care, warm them up, give them their stress dose of steroids, give them some thyroid hormone, and admit them. Okay? So that's our friend the thyroid. We made it through that one. We get to move on to our next exciting gland, the adrenal. All right. So let's do the adrenal now. You remember the adrenal, the cortex makes all these things like the glucocorticoids, like cortisol, the mineralocorticoids, like aldosterone. And you remember that the middle, the medulla there, makes all those like other things like epi and norepinephrine, okay? More of those like presser sort of things, right? But, the, but the, the periphery, the cortex makes the mineralocorticoids and the glucocorticoids. And when you're adrenal insufficient, it means your basically adrenals are not making these glucocorticoids or mineralocorticoids or both of them, all right? And remember for the, for the cortisol, the way that happens is you've got ACTH that comes from the pituitary that tells the adrenal to make cortisol, right? So the pituitary tells the adrenal to make cortisol, all right? So that's our friend, the adrenal. Let's talk about problems of the adrenal. Now, unlike the thyroid, remember when the thyroid, it's usually a thyroid problem with the gland itself. With the adrenal, it's usually not the adrenal itself. It's not usually primary adrenal problem. It's usually something wrong with the hypothalamic pituitary axis, so secondary or tertiary sort of thing. Okay, and what's the most common cause of somebody being adrenal insufficient? Just think about it. Somebody comes in your emergency department, they have adrenal insufficiency. What's probably one of the most common reasons that you'll get that for? Yes, yeah, probably steroids, right? So somebody was on chronic steroids, they were on it for a long time, their adrenals kind of shriveled up, and they abruptly stopped their steroids. Someone stole their steroids when they stole their Vicodin. I don't know, it happens, I guess, right? Um, so they lost their steroids or whatever it is. So they get a, and then all of a sudden they'll come in adrenal insufficiency. All right. So that's probably, that's one of those common sort of thing. Now let's talk about the rarer stuff, the adrenal itself. What things will mess up the adrenal itself? Less common ones. Let's go through some. First, Addison's disease. Addison's is an autoimmune disorder. So it's autoimmune destruction of the cortex. Okay. Um, so basically idiopathic autoimmune destruction of the adrenal and so therefore they get adrenal insufficiency. That makes a lot of sense. Infiltrative disease, anything that infiltrates in these or infections in the adrenals, TB, sarcoid, fungus, amyloid, all these sorts of things that get into your adrenals that can cause primary adrenal insufficiency. You can bleed into your, your adrenals, right? From over anticoagulation, from trauma. Um, remember that thing called waterhouse Friedrichsen syndrome where you've got meningococcemia and then you also get bilateral adrenal hemorrhage, right? Bilateral adrenal infarction and hemorrhage. Waterhouse Friedrichsen syndrome, so you can bleed into your, into your adrenals. Um, tumors, so primary tumors of the adrenals, METs to the adrenals can cause it as well. Drugs, uh, including Atomidate. You know our friend Atomidate, great drug. We love using it for intubation. You probably remember that if you took a normal person, measured their serum cortisol, and intubated them with Atomidate, and measured their serum cortisol later, they would drop their serum cortisol. It interferes with cortisol metabolism. Fortunately, a single dose of Atomidate, while it drops your level, it almost never really has important clinical consequences, okay? However, multi-dose Atomidate, or uh, in, the, in the old days when Atomidate was first coming out, they used to put people on Atomidate drips in the ICU for sedation. That'll give you a frank adrenal insufficiency. That'll, that'll knock the adrenals right out, okay? So single dose, don't worry about it. And I know there's the controversy in sepsis and that sort of stuff. Personally, I don't worry about it, okay? Um, but multi-dose atomidate or atomidate drips, that could definitely cause adrenal insufficiency. Talked about waterhouse Friedrichsen syndrome, okay? Um, <clears throat> let me talk for a moment about the hyperpigmentation thing. So there's a picture here of President Kennedy here because he had Addison's disease. Uh, and, you know, you tend to get hyperpigmented when you have primary adrenal insufficiency. Who remembers why that happens? What's going on? What is it? MSH, right? Melanocyte stimulating hormone. So here's what happens. When your adrenals themselves are messed up, they're not working because something has messed them up, your body tries to get them to work. And it tries to get them to work by making a bunch of ACTH, right? So it'll make cortisol. It says, let's make a bunch of ACTH and try to get these adrenals to work. Well, when ACTH is made, it's actually made as a propeptide, 
that is cleaved into ACTH and MSH, melanocyte stimulating hormone. And that melanocyte stimulating hormone does just what its name says, stimulates melanocytes, and it makes you hyperpigmented, okay? You'll have darker skin by having that extra MSH. And so it's only patients who have primary adrenal insufficiency, where the adrenals themselves are messed up, that are gonna get the darker skin, the hyperpigmentation, because they're making too much HETH and too much MSH. Does that make sense? If it's a pituitary problem, you're not gonna get hyperpigmented because the pituitary means you're not making the ACTH. That's the whole problem, right? So you're also not making MSH. So they don't get hyperpigmented. Primary adrenal insufficiency will get hyperpigmented. Okay, how do you do the test to figure out whether it is primary adrenal insufficiency? You, you know, somebody came in, they look a little hyperpigmented, they're a little weak and all this sort of stuff, and you're like, oh, I think maybe they've got adrenal insufficiency. The way you do the test is that corticotropin stimulation test. You basically give them a little dose of ACTH and you see if the adrenals respond, okay? You're giving them a dose of ACTH and seeing if the adrenals respond. So you measure a baseline serum cortisol, you give them a little dose of IV ACTH, and then you measure the cortisol. It's like at 30 minutes and an hour and two hours, something like that. Some serial measurements pretty soon after. And you're looking for that cortisol to go up if the, if the adrenals are normal, they should, right? It should go up a certain amount or a certain percent or a certain level. Again, you can look up the, the thresholds. But if it's going up normally, then the adrenals are fine. But if it's not going up normally, you've got a primary problem with your adrenals, okay? That's a corticotropin stimulation test. You're giving a little dose of ACTH and watching the cortisol go up. Okay. Um, so that was primary adrenal insufficiency. The adrenals themselves messed up. Secondary or tertiary means you've messed with something in the hypothalamus or pituitary, stroke, tumors, things like that, but also could be just prolonged steroid use and then all abrupt withdrawal. Lab abnormalities in adrenal insufficiency. Sorry, folks, just a little trivia you got to know. Hyponatremia is the most common electrolyte abnormality. You don't have mineralocorticoids, you don't have aldosterone, so you don't hold on to your sodium anymore. So you get hyponatremic and you might get hyperkalemic. And if you see that combination of low sodium and high potassium, either in real life or on the board exam, particularly on the board exam, go for adrenal insufficiency, okay? Because they're probably showing you that combo for a reason. Most patients don't have the full combo, but if you see it, I really want you to think about that. So low sodium, high potassium. They can have a low glucose because you don't have the cortisol, and they can have a lot of eosinophils as well, all right? How do patients with adrenal insufficiency present? If you remember, they are weak and they tend to be, uh, have hypotension. They can be, have orthostatic hypotension. When that's really bad, they have refractory hypotension. So they're in front of you, they've got sepsis, they're hypotensive, you're giving them fluids, they're not getting better. You're giving them pressors, they're not getting better. It's because they need the steroid, okay? They need the steroid. So refractory hypotension, think about adrenal insufficiency. And they can have fever from adrenal insufficiency itself. It's not always sepsis, all right? So nausea, vomiting, weak, things like that. Okay, how do we treat adrenal crisis? some fluids, some normal saline, or maybe even D5 normal saline if they need a little extra sugar, and give them some steroids. You can either give them 100 a hydrocortisone, right, which certainly works, works just fine, or an alternative is just to give them four milligrams of dexamethasone. Now, why would you ever pick the dexamethasone instead of hydrocortisone when it's so easy to remember the 100 a hydrocortisone, all right? Well, it turns out that hydrocortisone will interfere with that corticotropin stimulation test. It interferes with the cortisol assay. So if you know this person's got adrenal insufficiency, it's the third time this year they've come in with that, you know what's going on, by all means, give them the 100 hydrocortisone because you don't need to do that fancy test. You know what's going on. If you're really not sure and you want to be nice to your internist upstairs, you know, and you don't want to ruin their day, you know, mess up their corticotropin stimulation test for an internist, right? That's not fun. I mean, that was their whole day, right? Definitely a lot of fun, right? So in that case, you might just give them four dexamethasone, and that way they can still do the test upstairs, all right? So either 100 hydrocortisone or four dexamethasone, that'll work. And of course, they might need pressors for their hypotension. But the bottom line here is you can give them fluids, you can give them pressors. If they have adrenal insufficiency, you have to give them the steroids. If you don't give it, they will die. End of story, period, they will die. You gotta give it to them, all right? So that's that. Let's do hyperadrenalism. This is too much cortisol going on, right? Too much cortisol, so it could be too many steroids. 
at a tumor of the adrenal cooking out uh, um, cortisol, a pituitary microadenoma making too much ACTH. There are some cancers that will secrete an ACTH-like substance, like small cell or bronchi bronchial carcinoid uh, cancers. Signs of this, remember, too much cortisol, they get obese, they get overweight, but it's a truncal obesity. It's in the middle, the cent central truncal obesity. It's not the extremities as much, truncal obesity. Um, they can uh, get um, this buffalo hump in the back there. They get these purple stria, okay? Uh, they get the moon facies, right? Too much steroids, you've seen that, the round moon facies. So buffalo hump, moon facies, purple stria, all these sorts of things as well. You gotta get rid of the cortisol or whatever's causing the problem. So either get the tumor out, stop the steroids, whatever. That's Cushing syndrome, too much uh, um, of that, okay?